It's in your hands. Voters will now get a say on abortion rights and recreational pot. Once voters figure out how radical both of those are, they're going to fail. I think that, that folks are ready for this. The money behind the moves to get voters to the polls. Endangered fish dying in the Florida Keys. It was kind of very sad to see them you know, struggling. just struggling. We meet the scientists on the front lines. Hot hurricane season. You're talking about 160, 170% of normal, so definitely a very uh, active season we think is in store for 2024. The record prediction for the season ahead, we go straight to the source. The big news of the week, all live this week in South Florida. Good morning, I'm Janine Stanwood in this week for Glenn and Milberg. Pro-life, pro-choice, it's your choice. We begin this morning with the Florida Supreme Court weighing in to send abortion to the November ballot as Amendment 4. Reproductive rights will now be in the hands of voters, but in doing so, their rulings upheld the state's 15-week abortion ban and give the green light for a six-week ban to take effect May 1st. The near-total ban will block almost all access to abortions in the southern United States, where Florida had been somewhat of a haven for women seeking abortions from our surrounding states that already have six-week or total bans in place. Planned Parenthood was the plaintiff in the case to overturn House Bill 5, the ban on abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy. So we begin with Executive Director Laura Goodhue, Executive Director of Florida Alliance of Planned Parenthood Affiliates, with details on their strategy moving forward. Welcome, Laura, from Jupiter. That's right. Hi, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Laura, I want to talk first about what is actually happening right now. So women can, in the state of Florida, have an abortion up to 15 weeks. In May, it is six weeks. So what are you seeing in your clinics right now? Oh, we're seeing, uh, quite honestly, patients that are confused and scared um, for what's to come. Uh, I think as most people who have been pregnant uh, know six weeks is not enough time. Most people don't even know if they're pregnant by then. Um, and basically what this will do is it's a near total abortion ban. It does not have exceptions for rape or incest. And it will force many people who, you know, they may have health complications for themselves, their birth control might have failed, whatever the reason, they will have run out of options. And it's a really scary time. And so will people still be able to make appointments? Is six weeks enough time? Usually after your first missed period, that's not a whole lot of time. Um, before women really know that they're pregnant. So what do they have to do in order to secure an appointment? There's already a couple of barriers in Florida because of laws that have been passed by politicians. They have to wait 24 hours, which isn't medically unnecessary. And so all before six weeks, they'll have to realize they're pregnant, especially if they weren't trying to get pregnant. Um, they will have to go see a provider and then come back at least 24 hours later, all at the same time when a lot of other people may need appointments. Planned Parenthood provides the full range of reproductive health care services that includes contraception, testing and treatment for sexually transmitted infections. Um, we're even doing fertility um, treatments and the first visit for prenatal care. We are busy right now, but we do anticipate being busier. But it also means that a lot of patients will have to go out of state if they can get an appointment and travel. And so right now you and others are trying to get people to vote yes on Amendment 4. Do you think that that will galvanize people to go to the polls? Because I will tell you, at least here in the newsroom, when that uh, the, the six week ban or at least when we we knew that the six week ban would eventually uh, take effect in May, there weren't a whole lot of protests. We did not hear a, a lot from sort of the public, at least here in South Florida. So how are you going to get people to vote on this? That's a really good question, but I think once people just realize what the threat is, and it's more than just our reproductive health care, it's really about our choices and our options and government interference. Because for over a decade now, Florida politicians, and really all across the country, they have been telling women um, what to do and when to do and if and when they will become uh, parents. And what we've seen already with abortion bans is that people have, that have had wanted pregnancies, something goes terribly wrong. Maybe there's a fatal fetal abnormality or the health of the mother, you know, is a danger and they have to leave the state. We've already been facing this and that will only be exacerbated by this near total abortion ban without exceptions for rape and incest. And so it's really important that people find out about Amendment 4. It, you know, the vote will be in November. And what it does is that it limits government 
interference in our personal private lives. So however you feel about abortion, this simply says that Tallahassee politicians won't be making laws um, that take away our own personal rights and our rights to bodily autonomy. That is a high threshold, though, 60%. There have been other states like Ohio and uh, Kansas that have uh, passed these sort of uh, abortion referendums after the states limited them. Um, but, but those are simple majorities. In Florida, it's a 60% or more. Um, so, so just sort of talk about that effort to, to get out the word to voters about this. I think it's important to know that we have a 60% threshold in Florida because of the same type of political interference. The ways that politicians have interfered in our personal private lives and our rights to health care, they've also interfered in our rights to petition our government and made it harder for the voters to have their voices heard. That being said, I think a lot of people are waking up. They're understanding that, you know, government interference is, has no place in healthcare. They don't want to see their doctors and their nurses potentially prosecuted for a crime if they help their own patients with health care. So we're getting out that uh, education and we're informing voters of what's at stake for November. Some scholars have said that this could kick the issue of abortion then back to the courts, even if this amendment does pass. There's issues of, of personhood. Are you concerned about that? We are concerned, and as we saw in Alabama, you know, even politicians interfering in this issue means that people who want to seek fertility treatments like IVF are blocked and can't do that. Just last legislative session in Tallahassee, lawmakers did propose bills that would create fetal personhood and that would make common treatments like IVF out of the reach of Floridians. If this passes, this would protect the right to abortion before fetal viability, and, and many doctors say that's that's 24 weeks. So, so does this fetal viability, is this basically sort of the equivalent, would this be the equivalent in Florida to what the U.S. was before Roe was overturned? It is. It's simply, you know, before, uh, before pregnancy can survive outside of the womb, and the vast, vast majority of women seek abortions in the first trimester for whatever reason. Again, their birth control could fail. They miss their period. They don't have regular periods. However, pregnancies that go beyond that, um, and if they need an abortion, is mostly because it's a wanted pregnancy, but something's gone terribly wrong. And we've seen life-threatening cases in Florida of where women have gone into sepsis or shock because their physicians are afraid to treat them because of these restrictions. Uh, and this is just something that we can't have. And so these, this amendment is just common sense saying, look, the government shouldn't interfere in healthcare. It should be in between a doctor and a patient. And if they wanna con you know, consult with their family and their God, that's where these decisions need to be made. Laura, thank you so much for joining us on the show. We really appreciate it. We want to come back now with the other side of this contentious issue that has polarized Americans for decades. From pro-choice, we turn to pro-life. That's coming up next. Welcome back. This photo, when Florida's six-week abortion limit was signed, includes members from the National Pro-Life America group now turning their attention to defeating Florida's proposed Amendment 4. And so now we want to welcome in Katie Glenn Daniel, State Policy Director of SBA Pro-Life America. Hello, Katie, from Tampa today. Good morning. Katie, I, I think that our uh, Twitter conversation sort of dictates my, my first question to you, and that is, why are you voting no uh, on Amendment 4? Well, first of all, I'm voting no because I want the people to continue to have a say in this important issue, and we want to continue to make um, the gains that we've been making in Tallahassee to protect babies and serve their moms. So if we hand this back to the courts, it will be only the courts who make decisions around this issue for the foreseeable future. Um, we saw what happened for 50 years of Roe v. Wade. Why would we give our power back? I think that's the big first issue here is that this is about the people and our legislatures who we sent to Tallahassee be re being responsive to us under the amendment. That's impossible. And talk about convincing voters and the battle that you have to convincing voters that that is the right thing to do. There are some polls that show that more than 60% of Floridians say that abortion should be a right. 75% uh, of Floridians, at least in some polls, say that the six week ban uh, is not a good thing. So how do you convince others uh, that no is the way to go? 
Well, we pulled the six week um, heartbeat law last year as it was going through the legislature in English and Spanish statewide and found that 62% did support it. So there's data out there that points in all directions. Um, what's important is that voters need to understand that this initiative goes way too far for, for Floridians. Um, your last guest was talking about what the heartbeat law does. In fact, the heartbeat law has exceptions for rape, incest, human trafficking, and fetal anomalies, as well as, of course, always allowing for women to get health care in a life-threatening medical emergency. So this is what we've seen in other states, is quite frankly lies from the proponents of these initiatives who have a financial interest in performing as many abortions as possible. What we've seen in Florida the last three years is a, couple, is a very different direction for our state. Um, we saw our lawmakers pass the 15-week law when babies can feel pain, get overwhelmingly reelected, even picking up more pro-life seats, and then pass that heartbeat law, which will now go into effect in May. So we think Floridians are with us, and when we can talk about the truth of what the law does, they're going to see that this uh, initiative is way too extreme for Florida. So I'm glad that you set the record straight on the exemptions for rape and incest and, and health of the mother. Um, that is important. But I do want to ask you about this, because under that law, um, in order to show that you've been sort of the victim of trafficking or the victim of incest or rape, you have to show documentation of that. Um, and and in, in fact, there's some some polls and again it's sort of all over the place but but some surveys do show that about 21 only 21 percent of assaults are actually sexual assaults are actually reported to police do you think that that may be preventative um, and worrisome for women who are victims of sexual violence well, women who are victims need resources, they need support, they need services. So the law lists several different types of resources, either through law enforcement or through our medical community um, that could be used. But ultimately, um, many women are pushed towards abortion and are coerced into it in these situations. So they need to be given all their information, all their options, and not sent to Planned Parenthood, sometimes even by their abuser to cover up evidence of a crime. So we think, you know, the law was written taking these interests in mind, but ultimately women deserve support and protection um, and the people deserve that. If there are criminals out there, particularly with the human trafficking component of this, they need to be taken off the streets. For sure. But do you think that's too much to ask of a woman to provide documentation when so often they're too scared to go to law enforcement about it? Well, there are multiple different types of documentation that can be provided through the law. Um, ultimately, we are looking to support women and protect babies. We think that this law threads the needle to do that. And we think that Floridians are going to see that if their options are uh, some abortions, but be highly protective of children. And by the way, the legislature um, spending a record level of state money to support these families or abortion on demand with no limits, with no inspection and oversight. Um, going back to the 1980s when women were dying in South Florida abortion clinics, we think the, the decision is clear. What do pro-life advocates do about Donald Trump? If Donald Trump is the candidate, and it sounds like he will be, he has come out and he did at the end of 2023 saying that he thought that the six-week ban was a, quote, terrible mistake. Is there an effort to connect with Trump or the Trump campaign? Well, we certainly have been communicating that he should run on his pro-life record. Um, he did a great job in 2016 when he debated Hillary Clinton of laying out the contrast between being a pro-life and being pro-abortion, quite frankly. And he obviously um, brought justices to the court who were able to help us overturn Roe versus Wade, one of the worst decisions the Supreme Court has ever made. So we think he should be running on that record. He should be supporting a positive vision for families. The Democrats are all about saying, no, you can't. They tell you this baby will ruin your life. You can't do it. Uh, we see a pro-life Florida and a pro-life America that's a much more positive vision. Talk about strategy right now so that there have been other states like Ohio and Kansas that put and Kansas that put, put referendums like this on their ballot. Um, Ohio uh, passed a, a referendum to uh, allow abortion. So did Kansas uh, by a margin of 59 percent. So what's what's are you looking at that and, and what's the strategy here in Florida? We think Floridians need to hear the truth. And the first place to look to understand the truth of these initiatives is Ohio and Michigan. I've done live radio in Michigan where people called in and they said, I had no idea that voting for this would mean that our legislature would go and overturn the state's partial birth abortion ban. Um, in Ohio on Good Friday last week, the ACLU filed a lawsuit trying to get rid of all of Ohio's informed consent laws saying that women get information about alternatives. They get information about the duty of child support owed to them by the baby's father. 
Um, they are saying that because of this right to abortion, women don't deserve this information. That is just how extreme these initiatives are. Floridians should look at that and vote now. Do you think that Florida got it wrong by passing a six week ban? Had they left it with the 15 weeks, had the Florida legislature left it that way, there might not have been an effort to move this to the voters. Well, I think the abortion industry is going to do this no matter what, because they won't be happy with 15 weeks. They're the ones who went into court and got in Ray TW overturned because they were challenging the 15 week law. So I'm proud to have testified in support of the heartbeat law. Uh, we think many Floridians are with us saying that that is a place where we should be recognizing the unborn. And by the way, we're putting our money where our mouth is by having a record amount of spending for programs and services for moms and babies, not just through our health care, um, but across our government, but really thinking about what it takes to help families thrive in our state. That's our positive vision. We think people are going to support it. Katie, we thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you so much. Of course, November is just a few months away, so we'll talk to you in a little bit. Thank you. Meanwhile, the state Supreme Court is also greenlighting recreational marijuana that will head to voters this fall. We are back with that part of this week's big ballot news coming up next. Welcome back. Should recreational marijuana be legal in our state? You'll be the judge in November if you cast your ballot. The state Supreme Court ruling Monday, it too is now in the hands of voters. Steve Ancor representing Truly, provider of medical and recreational cannabis and CBD is with us today from Tallahassee. Hi, Steve. Hey, thanks for having me on. So my first question for you is, is there a big appetite for this? Are people clamoring for this? I think I've talked to a lot of people who say, it seems like if you want marijuana here in the state of Florida, you can get it. Well, yeah, there absolutely is clamoring for it. You know, right now in America, a majority of Americans live in a state where adult use consumption for adults is allowed. Another uh, 17 states have some sort of medical program. And in order to go through the medical program, obviously you have to be sick, you have to see a doctor, you have to pay for that, you have to pay to get a medical marijuana card. I think there's a high level of demand, especially when you see how strong the illicit market is, the gray market, as it were. Uh, and you combine those two factors, absolutely, there's a strong demand. And poll after poll after poll shows between 65 and 70 percent of the po voting public says they want this. There is still plenty of opposition, though. I know the Florida Chamber of Commerce, they've come out against it. So has the Florida Sheriff's Association. And just this week, uh, the governor said uh, he would be voting no as well. Let's take a listen. It's basically a license to have it anywhere you want. So uh, no time, place and manner restrictions. This state will start to smell uh, like marijuana in our cities and towns. It will reduce the quality of life. Steve, what do you have to say about that? Well, that's not true. The uh, amendment clearly states right there in the language, nothing in this amendment shall prohibit the legislature from enacting the laws they need to. The Constitution long is held. The Florida Constitution is clear on this that unless something is explicitly prohibited, then it's allowed to be legislated. And, and we see this every day in Florida, right? We are allowed, you have the right to consume alcohol, but you don't have the right to drink and drive. You don't have the right to drink on a, and walk into a PTO meeting or to an elementary school and drink. So the legislature has the authority and will still have the authority, and we will support those restrictions to say, hey, regulate time, place, and manner. We do it with tobacco products. You have the right to smoke tobacco products, but you don't have the right to smoke it on an airplane. You don't have the right to smoke it in a public place, a public park. And we would encourage the legislature to follow the amendment, to follow the Constitution, and say you cannot smoke in public places, especially in places where there might be children about. I'm very curious as to what the state will have to gain from this, because right now, if you have a medical card, you have to get a renewal from a doctor. There's a fee associated with that. You have to get your card renewed every year. There are fees. So the state is making money. So if this uh, passes Amendment 3, that essentially, you know, makes those cards, those medical cards unnecessary, right? So would the state be losing out? Explain no. that for me. And, and how, yeah. how does the state win? So a couple, couple thoughts. One is the medical marijuana, every state that has enacted a recreational or an adult use program on top of a medical program, the medical programs remain robust for several reasons. There's different products. And remember, if since it's con considered under medicine, it's not taxable. If it's uh, recreational adult use, the state benefits in several ways. One, they'll be able to tax that revenue and pay for any cost to the state. Secondly, you'll have a reduction 
in law enforcement activities. Law enforcement needs to spend their time on violent criminals, uh, other types of crimes, not somebody coming home from work and sitting down and enjoying some cannabis after work in the privacy of their own home. So the state's going to benefit several ways, one from the tax dollars, one from the reduction in law enforcement. The citizens are going to benefit as well. You know, just the other day, uh, a, a pilot crashed. He was taking ketamine. Why do I bring up ketamine? We're now finding, and this was in testimony in the Florida House of Representatives, 90 percent of uh, marijuana that was consumed by the FDLE, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, contained either enhancers like ketamine, like fentanyl, like meth methamphetamine, and other drugs. In the second category are dangerous herbicides and pesticides. Remember, we, we outlawed lead in our herbicides and pesticides many, many years ago. Well, overseas cartels don't have those same restrictions. And so according to the testimony presented in the Florida House of Representatives, 90% of the marijuana consumed on the streets contains either one of those categories of dangerous chemicals under a recreational regulated program. Currently under Florida law, these things are, uh, marijuana is grown indoors, so you have a reduction in herbicides or pesticides. Secondly, it's third-party lab tested to make sure there's no additives or uh, un unlawful chemicals in that. You don't have that same luxury when you buy something on the street. But Steve, there are legitimate concerns, though, about edibles. That's kind of a whole different thing. And those edibles would be legal, right, if Amendment 3 passes. And there are concerns that edibles, whether they get in the hands of kids or whether they're consumed by uh, adults, you know, we've heard stories of people who, who consume an edible don't don't realize that it's taking an effect. They, they consume more and, and people get sick from that. Um, so so how do you sort of allay concerns about that? Well, you're absolutely right. And that's why a regulated market is a better market, because what you're seeing right now out in the out in the real world, right, when people are buying from a street corner drug dealer, what they're getting are unknown enhancers that make these drugs far, far more potent. And many times that leads to death. We had about four months ago in, in, in North Florida, in Quincy, we had nine people die on the same day from what's called a hot batch of methamphetamine. It was loaded with fentanyl, a large amount of fentanyl, and they died. Three of those people were smoking marijuana. That's the danger we want to seek to stop. So, you know, if someone's going to overconsume, they're going to do that whether it's on the illicit market or whether it's on a regulated market. At least you know what you're getting. And then the dosages in the uh, legal regulated market, on the authorized regulated market, will be clearly labeled as to what the milligrams are, just like you do with ABV for beer, just like you do with proof for alcohol. We currently don't have that in the recreational because the only place you can get marijuana for your own personal consumption, if you're not in the medical market, is on the street corner, and that's a bad thing. All right, Steve, we'll let you have the last word. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see what happens in November. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, from marijuana, we turn to a marine mystery that has plenty of people talking and concerned in the Florida Keys. We are back with details of dozens of dead sawfish with the top investigator and our own Louis Aguirre, who's been leading the charge for answers. With a serious situation in the Florida Keys that continues to baffle scientists, dozens of endangered sawfish swimming erratically and some ending up dead. And this just in brand new video of yet another sawfish this weekend flopping in the shallow waters of Isla Mirada. Our environmental advocate Louis Aguirre has been reporting on this for weeks. He's here this morning, but first we want to show you his most recent report. Our sawfish continue to die right before our eyes. There's nothing I could have done to, you know, help it or drag it in, or you just kind of sat there and just kind of like watched it. Hard to see, and it's definitely heartbreaking. Tim Friend and Ashley Fermanic were in Key West Tuesday, visiting from Massachusetts when they came across what's now become a painfully prevalent sight. It was kind of very sad to see him, you know, struggling. just struggling. And Another critically endangered small two sawfish suffering in the shallows, this time at Fort Zachary Taylor Beach. It seemed like several people on the beach were trying to, they wanted to go and grab it and put it back in the ocean, but the conservation didn't allow them to. On Monday, NOAA launched an unprecedented emergency response, engaging partners like FWC to try and rescue sawfish found in distress. Officers could be seen in the water trying to help the massive animal. Sadly, it would not survive. FWC confirming it was a female, and now the 32nd small two sawfish reported dead since January, the fourth this week alone. I'm so sorry, buddy. With more than 100 witness accounts of others seen swimming erratically, beaching themselves. What the hell? Thrashing about in shallow waters. 
the Everglades to Key West, and now all the way north to the Boynton Beach Inlet. Wow. I'm gonna look that up. Oh. Since October, researchers have been out sampling the waters of the Lower Keys, believed to be ground zero for the devastating event. Still, there's no smoking gun. We don't really know. Um, again, this is something we have not documented before, so we have not seen this. What scientists are seeing are elevated levels of Gambier discus, a benthic microalgae linked to ciguatera that lives on seaweeds. They were anywhere from five times higher to about 30 times above averages that we've seen over the past 10 years or so. But are the levels of toxic Gambier discus high enough to cause this? The experts still stumped. Louie, thank you so much for joining us. You know, Thanks I'm in the Keys, me. you're the environmental guy. Mm -hmm. You've been talking to so many people. What have you learned? It's still such a mystery. It is a mystery and so many people are disturbed by it, especially Keys residents, because the city, it impact their lifestyle, potentially their economy and still question marks when scientists have been out there on the water since October. And we still don't know, we, even though we think it might be a proliferation of Gambier discus, they're not able to say conclusively that that is the smoking gun that we're looking for. The lead on this investigation is FWC. FWC. I'm so, so glad that we have Gil McRae, who's with us right now. He is the director of FWC's Research Institute. Um, so Gil, thank you so much for joining us. Can you just sort of give us the, the latest on what you're finding? Well, it's good to be with you. Thank you for having me. Um, so as the report said, um, we began to receive reports of fish swimming erratically back in November of last year. And since then, those reports have expanded from the Lower Keys north, although they're still concentrated in the Lower Keys. And also during that time, we've had a number of small tooth sawfish mortalities, which is concerning because it is an endangered species. I will say that the, the erratically swimming fish other than the sawfish they have not experienced massive mortalities, and they do appear to recover if they're moved into cleaner water, which supports potential exposure to a low-level toxin. We're working with a team of state, nonprofit, and federal scientists to try to figure out why the sawfish are affected differently, but it certainly is a concern. And we saw FWC in the water with the sawfish on Tuesday back in Key West, uh, FWC reached back out and said that was not an official rescue attempt. So what were we, what, what were we witnessing then in that moment? And then there, there is new video of FWC in the water with Moat Marine Lab yesterday. They captured a live sawfish in one of the canals off the Keys. Can you give us some insight as to what's happening here? Yeah, we have put together a team to attempt to rescue and potentially rehab sawfish that are in distress. We're very interested in figuring out whether sawfish if moved to cleaner water can recover like some of the other fish have however keep in mind this has never been done before and some of the sawfish that have beached themselves are very large it's a very tricky thing to find a sawfish that is healthy enough given the distress we've seen them in to survive the transport to a facility for potential rehab so the one that was caught yesterday is that the first one that you were able to catch i believe it is yes you know, you guys have been sort of front and center on this and, you know, it is a good thing because, you know, so many people have sort of in an information vacuum or what they perceive to be an information vacuum, they, they fill it with maybe misinformation or speculation. You know, I want to give a shout out to Captain Dave Dupre um, in the Florida Keys because he's gone on to some of these Facebook groups and have posted the public information that's available from FWC because, Gil, you and I were talking about this. You know, at this point, um, you know, this is not considered a fish kill. At this point, you're not thinking that this is because of anything coming from Lake Okeechobee. A anything that you want to dispel? Yeah, that's correct. There's no connection to Lake Okeechobee releases. And we understand the concern. It, it certainly is disturbing to see fish swimming erratically and these these large uh, sawfish beaching is, is also not something we like to see. But as far as we can tell, there's no link to any uh, pollutant. Uh, we have ruled out uh, things like red tide. Um, if in fact it is tied to Gambier discus or some other microalgae producing toxin, these are microalgae that occur naturally in the Keys. The questions relative to are they more abundant now than they typically are and are they producing more toxins or different toxins than they have in the past, that's where 
something we're working hard to figure out as we speak. And that, that's what's concerning because Gambier Disc is, is in fact tied to Ciguatera, even though there have been no reports of anybody getting sick from either eating infected fish or from having any contact with water. But Dr. Michael Parsons, who's leading the, the, the research on this out of Florida Gold Coast University, did say in our report that there is three to ten times the amount normally seen of Gambier Discus in the water, yet they don't believe Gambier Discus is a smoking gun quite yet. Can you help us understand why that is? If we're seeing more levels of Gambier Discus, why are we not saying conclusively that's what's causing this? Well, you have to realize there are multiple algal species that produce toxins and multiple toxins. So we have this matrix of multiple species and multiple toxins. All of that has to work, be worked through both in the field and in the laboratory before we can make a connection. Do you think that there's any potential connection to the reporting that we've done from last summer and the unusually high and prolonged uh, warm water event that we had in the Florida Keys and the corals dying? Could there be a connection there? There certainly could be. And whenever we have an event like this that's out of the ordinary, it makes sense for us to look at things that happened in the recent past that were also out of the ordinary. And certainly that very, very warm summer was out of the ordinary. One thing that I, I, I want you to address too for people who maybe don't understand what a sawfish is because they're these unusually look, looking creatures, mm -hmm. these are endangered species. Yeah, that's correct. A small tooth sawfish are endangered, federally endangered. They're a member of the shark family. Uh, they are, uh, their distribution has been reduced to Southwest Florida in the Keys. So we are a hot spot in Florida for recovery of these species. And we've been working on them for decades with FWC and our federal partners. So uh, when this event happened, we, we had a team of experienced sawfish biologists ready to respond and they are down in the Keys, again, attempting to uh, potentially rescue and rehab one of these fish so we can learn more about what might be causing these issues. I think what many of the conservationists are worried about is the loss of females. We, uh, we're seeing a, a ratio of one to one, if I'm not mistaken, of females to males that have been found dead in Florida waters. Uh, but let's bring back the uh, topic of Gambier discus because there's a hypothesis that was floated by not just Dr. Michael Parsons, but also uh, Dr. Allison uh, Robertson is working the toxicology part of this mystery from the University of South Alabama. They believe that it may have been, as you were saying, may have been sparked by warm waters, but Gambier discus does not thrive in warm ocean waters. If this is in fact fueled by Gambier discus, do you believe that the warmer waters can in fact cool this down? Because right now, people are worried about mitigation. Like, how do we put a stop to this? And right now, we're just watching this play out in real time. Yeah, those are good points. Typically, when the water warms, as we move into spring and summer, gambier discus densities are reduced. And if, in fact, these issues are tied to gambier discus and production of a toxin from that species, we would expect these issues to decline and ultimately resolve themselves as we move towards summer. So many questions, Gil, you know, thank you so much. I mean, I just think that there, there have been so many questions and so many concerns, not just by scientists, but also people who live in the Keys, people mm -hmm. who make their livings off the Florida waters. I think it's also important that we underscore that no one has gotten sick. And, and I think that's the big concern. What is the impact to humans? What is the potential impact to humans right now? We haven't seen that quite yet. Is that correct, Gil? Yes, yes, the Department of Health monitors the potential exposure to Ciguatera from consuming seafood, and they have uh, not documented any cases uh, in that part of the state in the, recent, uh, in the recent past. And Gil, where can people go every week? FWC updates your findings. Um, talk about where people can go to, to look at sort of the latest numbers. Yeah, you can visit our website at myfwc.com. You'll see links there to our weekly updates, as well as information on how to report a fish kill, fish swimming erratically, or specifically uh, issues with sawfish. And that's very important because it is because people are actually sharing these videos and sharing these images that we're able to respond in a very timely manner. I wanna stress that, that the public is definitely part of solving this mystery. Absolutely. Gil, let me ask you this, my final question, just in what you've seen over the last few weeks since some of these first um, erratic fish behaviors started getting reported, are you seeing a, a decline? Is this still happening steadily? Um, talk about sort of, sort of the, the arc of things right now. 
Well, it's tough to say for sure because we think as the word got out, people reported them more frequently. Uh, but it does seem that the level of calls we're getting to our fish kill hotline, other than the sawfish mortalities, which seems seem to still be an issue, uh, have either tapered off or plateaued a bit. But again, that could be an artifact of, uh, uh, you know, people either experiencing some fatigue or uh, perhaps the uh, communication of how to get these reports to us. Gail McRae with FWC, thank you so much for coming on the show today. We really appreciate it. It's an important issue, not just for the environment in the Keys, but all over Florida. So we do thank you for coming on. Thank you. And Louie, thank you so much for being here as well. I know you've been on the front lines of it. In. Yeah, <laughs> back in the field as soon as I'm out of here. That's right. <laughs> See you there, Louie. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Well, 23, 11, and 5. That is not Iowa Hawkeye star Caitlin Clark's latest stat line from the NCAA tournament. Nope, these are numbers that represent the worst April hurricane forecast in three decades. We are back with that theory and reaction up next. <laughs> Years. The Tropical Weather and Climate Research Team at Colorado State University has been releasing April hurricane forecasts. Earlier this week, they just released their most active prediction in those 29 years since 1995. And we're about to take you to Colorado State. But first, we welcome Local 10 meteorologist Brandon Orr with his take on their take. Hey, Brandon. <laughs> hey, guys. Yeah, it, it definitely got a lot of attention when this forecast came out. Colorado State University, one of the leaders in long-range hurricane forecasting, predicting about 23 named storms this season, 11 of those becoming hurricanes. Compare that to last year, we had 20 named storms, which by the way, was the fourth most on record. So the prediction for this year is a little bit above that compared to average about 14 named storms. Now there's many factors that go into coming up with a long range hurricane forecast like this, but there's two in particular, two big ones that are really standing out this season. And the one is that developing La Nina. We were in a El Nino pattern last year. A La Nina means cooler than average water out here near the equator in the Pacific, really changes up the weather pattern, especially into the Atlantic, leading to a lower wind shear. Wind shear typically tears apart these tropical systems, keeps them a little bit weaker. So lower wind shear would lead to typically stronger storms or more frequent storms. The other is uh, water temperatures. If you look at this map, anywhere you see these orange and reds. It's above average water temperature. It covers the whole thing almost from side to side here. But we look at one uh, area in particular, and that's the main development region. That's where most of our storms develop. Ocean temperature there right now on average is about 79 degrees. That's more typical of July, not so much early April. So that's kind of crazy in itself. Uh, that should say typical temperature for this time of the year is about 76 degrees. So between the developing La Nina and the warm water, Janine, all the cards are kind of pointing towards a more active season. Yeah, hot, hot weather, rapid intensification. So yes. uh, we, we are bracing for it, right? Yeah. Uh, Brandon, you're going to stay with me, actually, as we welcome Nick Mesa, who is from Miami and a Gator, but now at Colorado State working on his master's, formerly with the NOAA's Hurricane Research Division. Welcome, Nick, from Fort Collins, Colorado. You have a very unique perspective there. Oh yeah, thanks for having me, appreciate hey, it. Talk to us, you know, we, we wait for these predictions every year to come out, uh, Dr. Klotzbach and, 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 and you and, and the whole team. What goes into making these predictions every year? And, and this year, I think, I think has a lot of us kind of concerned. Yeah, yeah, and that's a great question. I appreciate you asking that. Um, one of the main things that goes into these forecasts is typically looking at the past 25 to 40 years of data. So typically we can see um, in this past historical data is what do the conditions at this time of year in March and April, how do those correlate with a, the hurricane season that follows? So Brendan mentioned it earlier, typically we look at how warm those sea surface temperatures are in the Atlantic and how the ensuing um, ENSO or El Nino Southern Oscillation, how that looks like for the peak of hurricane season. In addition, we also like to use a combination of statistical and dynamical models to really give us a broad range of potential outcomes. And overall, this year, um, a lot of them have pointed to an extremely active hurricane season, unfortunately. I feel like when we report the news, we hear more and more about these hurricanes that get so strong so quickly. But Brandon, you were saying this is it's nothing new. It's just that it's happening more frequently. Yeah, we've seen rapid intensification in hurricanes going way back, but it definitely is becoming 
a little bit more frequent. You mentioned Hurricane Otis. We all remember that one that hit Mexico. It went from a tropical depression, tropical storm to what a, a very powerful hurricane, one of the strongest ones ever to hit that part of Mexico on the Pacific coast in no time. Nick, talk to me also now from sort of a science perspective. You guys put out your predictions. Do you have any sort of influence then on the messaging? What do you think that sort of politicians could do a better job of in warning people about these hurricanes that are approaching more intensely? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we can kind of break this up in different time scales, right? So one of the main reasons why, like, why we like to put these out in, um, in April is because this gives us a nice amount of time ahead of time before hurricane season starts. Um, I was born and raised in Miami, so one of the things my parents always like to do this time of the year was, you know, make sure your trees, your, your trees are trimmed, make sure your generators are working, make sure abuelo and abuelita have their hurricane kit ready <laughs> and their houses are ready to go. Um, and yeah, as from a politician perspective and things like that, you know, it's just communicating that as these storms, you know, as they threaten your area, you know, to make sure you're listening to National Hurricane Center guidance, making sure you're listening to um, your local emergency management officials as to where the storm is headed and what potential impacts may be in your area. And what I found interesting when we put this out on social media, Nick, and the number one question we got is how confident are we in a forecast like this? Because if you remember last year, we had kind of conflicting signals. We had uh, the El Nino, which kind of says eh, it could be a, a less active season, but we also had the warm water temperatures right. kind of going against each other. This year, all the signs are kind of pointing towards a more active season. So how does that play into your confidence uh, for this forecast? Yeah, last year was a weird one. We really had two signals that are typically associated with two different um, hurricane season outcomes, I guess, and had those clashing together. This season, as you mentioned, we have two factors that typically favor a um, pretty active season. So that's kind of lending to an unusually confident forecast for an extremely active hurricane season. That being said, it's still a little bit early. So of course there's a bit margin of error and we do have ensuing forecasts coming out in um, June, July and August. But as of right now, there is a, a pretty decent amount of certainty um, for an extremely active hurricane season, just because of how hot these uh, temperatures are in the Atlantic and the pretty robust signal that we're going to have a, a pretty good La Nina by the time of peak hurricane season. Nick, thank you so much. We really appreciate you joining us. You know, Brandon, my, my question for you is just, you know, as a meteorologist and, and as, a, as a forecaster, what do you want people to know? Because every year these hurricane seasons come upon us. Uh, sometimes these hurricanes, they do. They, they intensify very quickly. Um, you know, I think people want, you know, hard and fast answers. Yeah. But is, is it getting harder to forecast? There's definitely a lot more going into it, and, and it's, it's not consistent from year to year. Well, just like last year, where we saw record warm water temperatures that we've never seen before, so we don't know how to compare that to the past. But I think the main takeaway here is, even though it's, we're forecasting a more active season, this doesn't tell us where the storms are going. So it doesn't tell you how many are going to actually make landfall. So you take uh, Andrew, for example, Hurricane Andrew, 92. We only had seven named storms that entire season, but it was that one storm that oh, actually made it here. And then we had other years where it was so active out into the Atlantic, but in Florida, nothing. Uh, Nick, and then talk to me just very quickly because we only have a few minutes left. You have the predictions that are out now. And then do you at some point then revise those predictions as the months go on? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, we have um, additional forecasts in June, July and August. And that kind of helps us, you know, as we get closer to hurricane season, once we actually enter hurricane season, we can see what those current conditions are and kind of hone in on those forecasts and what the impacts may be for um, the ensuing hurricane season. It is not always an so exact sign. for those. <laughs> Nick, thank you so much. Brandon, really appreciate both of, course, of you of talking course. to us about the hurricane season already in April. I can't believe it. <laughs> Almost here. Yeah, it's coming up fast. Love it. Thank you so much to both of you. We will be right back. It's over, can you believe it? <laughs> well, not really. Listen, if you want to rewatch today's interviews or listen to the This Week in South Florida podcast, just scan the QR code with your phone. It'll take you right to This Week in South Florida section on local10.com. We had guests from all over Florida, all over the United States. It was great. So glad to have them here. And thank you for being with us.